Uh, welcome to lesson 10 of the NPTEL course on industrial automation and control. So, today we are going to talk about uh, data acquisition systems and before we describe the instructional objectives, let me say a few words about why they are so important. Uh, you know, uh, so far in the course we have, uh, first of all in the first two lessons we have seen that, uh, the we have seen the industrial automation pyramid, right. So, we saw that one of the, one of the major uh, features or characterizing features of advanced automation is that uh, there is a lot of data flow up and down. That is, data actually uh, gets into the into computers and it is all about computers because there are computers at every layer of the automation pyramid of various types which do a lot of real time computing right and they do control optimization etc and that is how the benefits of industrial automation are actually realized. So, uh, so there is a lot of data flow from one level to the other right and now all this data which is actually basically acquired from the plant. Uh, Floor, where the where the where the actual machines are from the plants from the from the from the industrial equipment, they are they actually get into the, these computer systems through the sensors. So we have studied sensors that how these process uh, quantities are sensed, and today we are going to end our sensor module by looking at the data acquisition systems, which will interface to the sensor on one side, and to the computer on the other side. So, through these systems the, the data will the analog data usually analog there can be some digital data also. So, the analog data will come through the sensors get converted from their physical forms into some electrical forms and then through the data acquisition systems will get into digital form into the computer. And then they are going to flow then they are going to be utilized by the various algorithms residing at these computers and they are going to get communicated to other computers after various processing and get utilized at the various levels of automation. So, what we are going to study today is how the data which is which is coming from the sensors gets into the computers or how digital data is going to be acquired right. So, that is the subject of the lesson today. So, moving on. Uh, we have as instructional objectives to get familiar with the structure and components of typical data acquisition systems and to understand the basic mechanism of the process of sampling you know by which data sampling and quantization because when we have digital data we do not have all the points on the on the continuous process, but we have points values of the signals which are uh, at close intervals or at intervals of the sampling time and it is not only it is it's a it is not a because we are going to manipulate it in the computer and the computer although it has a large number of bits and usually quantization may or may not be an issue, but nevertheless there is a quantization issue as well and uh, that whether it is important or not that depends on the computer. So, it's a, if it is an 8 bit computer then it could be important if it is a 32 bit floating point computer it may not be important. In any case we will take a look at the basic concept of sampling and quantization and finally, we will see some typical circuit architectures that actually physically how is it that the analog electrical signals get converted to, to, to digital signals which are interfaced with the computer hardware. So, we will we'll look at that. So, these are the basic objectives. So, coming on to a data acquisition system what this figure sh we, we, we want to define it first. So, we define it as follows that it is a right. Uh, so, it is a collection of hardware and software components let me let me choose. So, uh, it is a collection of hardware and software components that enable a computer to receive physical signals. So, you see this is what this picture says that this is the process 
maybe I have to change my pen again. So, this is the process, then and there are various you know uh, hardware for example, data is may first enter through signal conditioning modules, it, it, may, it may be serial data also sometimes it, it may go to go to go to PLCs or it may go through you know these are some actuators for example, this looks like a this looks like a valve um, some, something like a motorized valve. And finally, so from all this equipment, there are through data acquisition processes that it actually gets into a it gets into a computer. So once it gets into the computer through this sort of you know electronic boards, and there is some software residing in the computer. So this software does two things. It firstly helps to uh, helps these cards to transfer the data into the computer or other interfaces and secondly it may help in you know the actual usage of the data that is in, in terms of display, in terms of uh, decision making, trending, alarm generation what, what have you. So some of it may, may be utilized at that computer itself where it is being acquired and some of it may actually be transmitted to other parts of the system through computer networks. So at, so at that point it becomes pure computer communication. So we are primarily going to look at this part of the system, where from various equipment on the plant, the, the data gets into the computer, right. So uh, so let us first look at a block diagram and see the major uh, functionality, I am sorry, mm, I do not know what is happening here. So, this is in this block diagram we have this physical process, change of pen again, this is the physical process and then this is the sensor, up to this we actually understand. Uh, now from the sensor, now the as we have understood, as we have learned that the sensor itself may have some signal conditioning, but at the same time there may be further signal conditioning required or in some cases if the sensor signal conditioning if, if you know if, if, if it is not possible to uh, put signal conditioning electronics at the sensor sometimes the, sen the signal conditioning electronics like things like amplification can be put as part of the data acquisition card itself. So you have such signal conditioning here which is typically analog signal conditioning and then you have a sampling and hold circuit which is uh, which is put we will we'll see what it does and then finally it gets into digital domain through a, through a circuit which is typically referred to as the analog to digital converter or the ADC, this is a very well, well used term and then so at the output of the analog to digital converter you have bits, so you have a number of bits which represent the value of the analog signal at a particular sampling instant and then that those those lines or those bits have to be transfer transferred to the computer. So you need an interfacing mechanism by which the computer can accept the digital data. So these are the typical you know this is the part which is called the data acquisition system. This is the data acquisition system which we will sometimes refer to as a DAS. So this overall process what does it it it, it the sensing part is comes from the sensor which is typically not a not part of the signal conditioning and then uh, there is electrical signal conditioning then there's that, that then there could be multiplexing sample and hold multiplexing means that you know time division multiplexing that is looking if you have a number of analog sensors very quickly you scan the channels so first see this one convert this to digital then see that one convert this to digital and so on so that is called multiplexing and then sample and hold, so sampling and holding the signal for that small interval of time when it is being converted. Then eddy conversion, the con process of converting it to digital and interfacing with computer and then finally this is also not strictly a part of the data acquisition uh, board. Uh, but the, but sometimes it is a part of the data acquisition, it is considered to be a part of the data acquisition system, 
because generally data acquisition vendors will not only give you this sort of components they will also supply you with the software which works with these this data and can can you know display it can can store it can uh, trend it analyze it so various functionality of software are also provided for ease of use okay so that's what you do in a typical data acquisition system so what do we do in signal conditioning oops yeah so what you do in signal conditioning is uh, you could do amplification this is very important because uh, as we'll see in detail this is important because every AD converter has what is called this dynamic range and it is important that the analog signal that you are uh, sort of presenting at the input port of the AD converter is uh, utilizes the dynamic range of the AD converter otherwise you are going to have approximation errors larger approximation errors than are necessary. So it is important to amplify the signal to increase resolution. Isolation is typically required because these field signals can be sometimes be at high uh, they, for example you know these analog channels generally come either as uh, single ended or as differential. So when you have single ended it means that this, this, line, this value that is going to be the value of the analog voltage is actually with respect to the ground electrical ground of the AD converter. So the AD converter is also an electrical circuit that has a ground. So when you are applying it in a single ended mode this voltage will be measured by the AD converter with respect to its own ground and then convert it that value. On the other hand when you, when you give it a differential input then what happens is that there are two inputs provided to the AD converter. So there is a plus and there is a minus terminal. And the difference in these two signals are provided right so this so this the, the the potential of this can be quite different from the ground so now the voltage difference v plus and v minus actually the signal value that you will get will be proportional to v plus minus v minus now this v plus and v minus can be at pretty high voltages if, if they are coming from let's say a motor winding suppose you want to measure a, a motor winding temperature so it's 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 not uh, in fact if you connect such high voltages to the AD converter electrically it might it will get it might get damaged. So therefore what you do is you put uh, put an isolation circuit such that the input side is actually galvanically isolated with the output side. You have various mechanisms of isolation like optical like you know uh, capacitor based or uh, transfer transformer based inductive coupling etc. Then you have filtering. Filtering is required for noise removal. As we'll see, it is also required for a uh, phenomenon called anti-aliasing. So, uh, and we, you, you could do some linearization in the signal conditioner itself, or uh, or you know sometimes you can do the linearization. One of, one, of the, one of the benefits of digital data acquisition is that you can do that linearization much probably much more easily in uh, software. So. So now you have, so th this is how you condition the each analog channel before you present it for AD conversion, right? Now it, it, it turns out if you see a, if you see any standard data acquisition system that they typically uh, will specify that they can take eight analog channels simultaneously, apparently simultaneously. Now how do you get eight analog channels simultaneously? So typically it is uh, the conceptually the scheme is something like this. So it is done through a process called multiplexing. So, so, so typically you have you know let us say these four channels of analog signals are being presented at these four inputs right. So what you do is if you these are you know electronic switches which can be put on or off depending on this address signal. So maybe this address is 0, 0 this is 0, 1 this is 1, 0 and this is 1, 1 right. So, <coughs> so what happens is that 
if you close this switch then this signal gets connected actually this is a not connected here this is connected and goes to the sample and hold and goes to the ad conversion on the other hand if this signal is connected this will go so actually so if you connect these four switches in quick succession then over a time interval let us say the overall time interval is delta t now within this delta t if you divide delta t by 4 and then apply these switches on at these one after the other within that overall time delta t then every delta t interval you will get four values of these signals so now if you if you if you if you if you are willing to ignore this slight difference between the timings that is if the if the if the, if the, if the timing is close enough compared to the rate of variation of these signals then you can kind of kind of implicitly assume that they are all signals which which these are the four channels uh, after the sampling these four channels you would get into the computer four values so you can for your future purpose you can assume that those were the values of the signals all the four which existed at some time at the beginning of delta t, uh, at time delta t without differentiating between this you know delta t by 4 and all that so this is called multiplexing then we have sample and hold so why we have hold is that while the eddy converter is converting the signal the signal it is sometimes necessary that the signal is maintained at the input but for but that maintaining need not be done by the switch because if you see these these switches take finite time for getting switched on and off so you just so you put another additional circuit such that you put on the switch so let this voltage be sensed by that circuit and then this circuit is this circuit is called the sample and hold circuit the circuit is such that it will hold that voltage value now you can open the switch again but this value will be held and so the, so so the eddy converter will actually see this held value even if this switch has been opened so this opening will take some time and it will be ready to close the next switch after let us say another delta t by 4 right so this is called the sample and hold procedure where a particular time instant value is stored and held for a small interval within a circuit right this is called sample and hold so while at the switching point you may you may close the switch for uh, very small points of time so you you get these values at the, or, or of the various these are the samples so while this could be for channel number 1 channel number 2 channel number 3 channel number 4 and then again channel number 1 so you have these four channels but at the output of the hold circuit you will find that this value 0 is being held up till the value is sent to again the hold circuit is, is is instructed that now you you release that held value and now acquire a new value so by the time channel, the next channel switch has been put on and the value has stabilized there so now the hold circuit senses the new value and then again holds it for the next interval so it holds it for the next interval then again it senses the new value and then again holds it so this is what happens by a sample and hold right that's because we need to hold it because otherwise sometimes the ad conversion can get into error if the signal if while the converter is converting if the signal vanishes from the input terminal then the ad converter can get into problems so so now so we need see basically between the in between the signal conditioned input and the ad converter input there is this block which 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 actually satis does does two things first it will multiplex several channels and second it has to do sample and hold now this it can do in, in 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 two ways and which one you will choose depends on depends on uh, how fast your signals are varying and how fast is your sampling frequency okay so this is a case where you see that uh, so we first present this architecture this is, a, this is the analog input subsystem right so here is the ad converter so you are seeing between these input signals then signal conditioning then this is the ad converter input so 
here in this case what you are doing is that you have put a multiplexer on each channel and then you put uh, you know uh, anti aliasing filter this can be also th this can also be a part of this filter if you want because the anti aliasing filter may be different for different uh, channels and then you put a, so if, if 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 that is not required to have different different anti aliasing filter and if the transient response of the anti aliasing filter is fast enough then you can actually have uh, you can actually put one anti aliasing filter and then one sample and hold amplifier so you see that this channels you put uh, you, you are saving cost because you are putting only one anti aliasing filter and one sample and hold circuit and for all the let's say four or eight channels so the assumption is that now what happens is that remember that so the difference is that now you, you, when, when you get these four values at the end of delta t remember that these four values are actually sampled delta t by four times later so they are actually not samples at the same theoretically at the same accurate instant of time now, now if that makes a difference if that doesn't make a difference to you then having one filter and one sample and hold is okay and that's cheaper right so you go for this architecture but if it does make a difference to you then you have to look at the next architecture which is called the simultaneous sample and hold circuit where after signal conditioning you have this sample and holds at for all channels individual sample and holds and a what I have not shown but what exists is that there is a control signal which will go to all these sample and holds so that each sample and hold will simultaneously sample all these channels that is possible now because you have because you have uh, put separate sa separate sample and hold circuits so they will so you, so they will now these so they will hold the values so now remember that the values which are being held here correspond to samples at the same instant of time see they are going to be read into the ad little bit later but they are time synchronous in the sense that the those four values represent values of process variables at the same instant of time so the sample did simultaneously and held it simultaneously and then read it serially because you are having one ad converter if you had different ad converters then probably you could have gone for uh, simultaneous ad conversion also but that's generally hardly necessary because the ad converters are quite fast and because we are talking about processes yeah, physical processes so their their dynamics would be complete would be quite slow and the ad converter speed is more than accurate so you would, and the ad converter is expensive so you don't want to have more than one ad converter rather than have more than one sample sample and hold channel right for simultaneity so that's simultaneously simultaneous sample and hold now before we look at the ad converter let's take a look at some sampling concepts you know first thing that we must remember that uh, the sampling value which you get from the ad converter is at the sampling instant so it is just at the sampling instant and ideally speaking so you have you have a signal so you have a signal analog and you are getting the sampling it here and here and here i'm sort of exa exaggerating actually you don't sample it so farther away you sample it much closer but to just to drive home the point what i'm saying is that you have got the value of the signal here and the value of the signal here and ideally speaking you don't know what the values of the signals are over over let's say here or here or here you don't know that because you have not got those values right so what you what you do is you you make an assumption right so so the the hold why, why i say the hold strategy is that this this hold is not the sample and hold because the sample and hold will simply hold the signal but when you are using the signal so for example suppose you want to plot this signal on on a graph so are you going to plot it 
as if this signal is held up to this point and then held up to this point and then come, comes down. So, are you going to plot it like this when you are going to plot it or are you going to plot it like this then let me use a different color. The alternate way of plotting it would be to plot it from between this and this it is a straight line like this but between this and this you would say that I will interpolate, I will do a linear interpolation. So, when I will plot it, I will plot this yellow line, right. So, what I am saying is that if you want to plot it as an as an as a, as a continuous signal, then you may choose appropriate uh, interpolation strategies for to construct a continuous signal which will be an approximate version of the old signal. Now, the question is, so obviously you can you can understand that how accurate this digital approximation is with the analog one depends on what? So, it depends on two things. Firstly, it depends on how close like for example, if you had if you had taken rather than doing it this far, if you had divided it into let us say these intervals and if you had got this value and this value and this value, then your approximation would have been like this, right. So, you would have gone from here to here, from here to here and from here to here and then here to so you, so, you see that you are able to do and then you would have got it here and here and here. So, you would have followed the analog signal much more close. So, in general closer sampling will give you better accuracy, but, but it is also a lot of, but it is also more work. So, uh, 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 more work, faster, so faster sampling and faster data processing. So, you have to determine what is the appro appropriate level of error that you can tolerate and what is the maximum amount of work that you can do within a given time, right. So, it turns out that there are certain fundamental principles to be obeyed because if you do not do that, if you, if you, if you so, so ideally speaking you would like to sample, uh, you would like to sample at the lowest possible rate uh, and trying to keep the error uh, low and especially you would generally you would like to keep the high frequency errors low. Uh, you, you, you may have some high frequency errors, but generally you want that the low frequency errors uh, that is the, let us say the average values over certain time intervals etcetera should be pretty accurate, right. So, the generally the low frequency component of the of the signal is actually of more use for the purposes that we are discussing and so we, we do not want low frequency errors, right. So, that is what I am saying that if you have an analog input and if you have 4 samples per cycle and if you have 8 samples per cycle and if you have 16 samples per cycle, so you see gradually you are getting a better and better representation of the analog input. Now, there is a you know benchmark rule which everybody uh, talks about is called the so called the, Na the, the Nyquist rate of sampling. Actually, this is this concept is, is explained in this diagram that imagine that you actually truly have this sine wave which you are sampling. This is the real analog wave, right? This is the real analog wave and being not aware of the Nyquist sampling theorem, you have sampled it at these points, right? So, what happens is that now, now, now you would like to reconstruct the signal, right? Now, in the computer you have got these values. So, when you reconstruct the signal, you will suppose you do a linear reconstruction. So, you, you will get this wave. So, you see that what you actually reconstructed is a much lower frequency sine wave and this high frequency sine wave is completely lost. So, you made a major error here. It is not, it, 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 so it, it turns out that theoretically speaking, you cannot reconstruct a signal unless you sample it at twice the rate of the largest frequency content that is largest frequency signal that is present. So, so suppose you have a signal which is 5 hertz and another signal which is 100 hertz, then theoretically speaking you cannot reconstruct the signal even with an infinite number of samples unless you sample it at least at 200 hertz, right. But since we are not concerned with theoretical reconstruction, we have to actually reconstruct it. So, therefore, a practical rate would be 5 to 10 times of the maximum samples, uh, maximum sampling, uh, maximum frequency signal present. 
So if you have 100 hertz present, you typically like to uh, sample it at 1 kilohertz or minimum 500 hertz, right? So this says that, so basically if you don't do that, what there is, there is something happens called aliasing. Aliasing means that one, one frequency signal will appear from the samples to be of completely a different frequency. It will appear as a different lower frequency signal. So you are going to get a lot of low frequency error which is, which is bad generally. So, so exactly that is what is happening. So your original signal was, oops, so your, I do not know what is happening here. There is some problem with this. Uh, let me, let me. So, uh, yeah, maybe no, it will work now. Oh, 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 I understand what is happening. I understand what is happening. Yeah, yeah. But I do not understand why, how it came to be. Okay, uh, so so that's what is uh, so that's what happens. One frequency appears in another, another frequency, and that's called aliasing. So therefore, what do you do? What what you do is so now this leads to uh, a concept. So 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 what you do is you actually need to restrict. So you have a certain sampling rate which is fixed. You can't change that. You don't know what frequency components are actually present in the analog signal. So to make sure that you don't get low frequency errors, what you do is you actually put a filter which whose cutoff frequency ensures that you have no frequencies beyond let us say uh, one tenth of the sampling frequency. So the sampling frequency is fixed, but the anti alias you actually put a filter which is called the anti aliasing filter which will ensure that whatever the signal content is, only those frequencies which are less than one tenth of the sampling frequency are going to go through and appear at the input of the AD converter, the others are going to get blocked so that they cannot create any low frequency error, right? Okay. Having understood the basic idea of sampling, we show the, so we say that an anti-aliasing filter is an analog filter that removes signal frequencies above Fs by 2, where Fs is the sample frequency. Actually, this Fs by 2 is actually a theoretical rate. It will not remove above Fs by 2, but would perhaps in a practical case remove frequencies above Fs by 5 or even Fs by 10. So it is a low pass filter incidentally. So this is, so you put that filter typically between the signal conditioner and the uh, ADC uh, or in a multi channel case you put it uh, either at the channels or you put it after the multiplexer. So here is the sample and hold circuit, very simple one. Uh, so uh, for example, so you, you, you can see that you have uh, two amplifiers. This, this is nothing but a buffer, okay. So this is nothing but a buffer. So whenever, so this is a switch, you know, this is an electronic switch. So whenever you turn this switch on, this is a, this is a this is a MOS. So when you, whenever you turn this switch on, what happens is that these two points, you can say that they are connected, okay. So this is a buffer, unity gain buffer. So whatever voltage you apply here, they will apply here and they will charge it up this capacitance very quickly. This switch resistance is small, so it will fast charge up and this capacitor voltage will, as long as this switch is on, this capacitor voltage will, will, will follow this voltage, right? So that is the sampling phase. So as long as this switch is on, this voltage is tracking this voltage, changing along with that. The moment you turn this switch off, so now this switch is off and this capacitor voltage on this side sees high impedance, on this side also sees high impedance. So the charge in the capacitor cannot escape, right? So this voltage, the last voltage with the capacitor had is held and this is another buffer 
So this output will now be held at this voltage. Next time you put it on, again this, this capacitor voltage is going to change according to V1. So you first switch it on, that is the, that's the sample command, this capacitor voltage starts stacking this voltage, then you switch it off and this voltage is held which is transferred to the output, right. So this is the typical sample and hold circuit. So we have to understand that then there are a number of input analog channels and the input channels can be differential or single ended as I said and I explained the meaning. Now the, this multiplexing says that the if you are the that is the maximum suppose the eddy converter can, can, uh, can convert let us say theoretically speaking 100,000 samples per second. If you, are, if you are having 8 channels, then effectively each channel maximum can be sampled at 100,000 samples divided by 8. So that is the throughput and so, so the number of, so actually the, uh, often times it happens that the sampling, uh, maximum sampling rate specifications of the AD converter are given and the number of channels are given. So one has to uh, be able to infer what is the maximum sampling frequency per channel. So that is the final sampling frequency per channel that is going to be effective on the each channel. So that is why this throughput question comes. So next let us let, let's come to the question of quantization. So we have now seen that an analog signal after sample and hold present itself at the analog input pin of the AD converter, right. So uh, now it gets converted to an n bit digital number, right. So, so for example, here is a case that suppose you have, this is a 3 bit ADC, right, Rather somewhat hypothetical, but 3 bit ADC where, so which means, so with 3 bits you can represent 8 numbers, 2 to the power 3, right, from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 2 to the power 3 minus 1, that is 7, so 0 to 7. So you see that the, the number 0 corresponds to 0 volts. And the first, the 1 corresponds to 0 0.125 volt. It's so suppose the every ADC has what is called an analog reference voltage, which, which decides its dynamic range as I was talking about. So hypothetically, if the dynamic range is 1 volt, generally it is 10 volts, <coughs> 10 volts is a very typical figure. Suppose it is 1 volt, then the, then each, so 2 to the power 3 is equal to 1. So 1 to the power 3 digital is equal to 1 volt. So 1 digital or, or the number 001 represents 1 by 8 volts, right. So this signal will become from 0 to, from 000 to 001 when this signal reaches 0 0.125 volts or 1 by 8 volts. So actually the any signal between 0 and 0 0.125 will get quantized to this 0. This is called quantization. Similarly, 0.125 to 0.25, all these will get mapped to 0, 0, 0, 001 and so on. And finally, 0.875 to 1 volts will, will get mapped to 111. So this is quantization and obviously, uh, the higher the number of bits, the smaller is, that, is, is the quantization interval and the better is the resolution. But then we can always make an eddy converter of 32 bits, 64 bits, why not? because these are related to, because you have to make them, the, it is not just the number of bits. Finally, the, they must represent that, that mapping, that 1 represents 0.125, this must be accurate. So when you increase the number of bits, you can understand that if you have, let us say, a 16 bit eddy converter, then you have 1 by 65,000 is your resolution, right. So the circuit should be able to resolve between 1 by 65,000 will be, you know, something like, uh, not even millivolts, right? It is it is of the order of microvolts. So the circuit should be so accurate that and the the environment should be so less noisy that you will be able to separate between those. If you don't do that, then your audio converter just because of noise, it will this even if you present a constant signal, it, it, its its digital bits will start oscillating, and the last few bits will anyway be useless because of noise. So 
that is why it is very difficult to uh, construct eddy converters of uh, number of bits more than you know 18 maybe. And generally for this kind of things 12 to 16 are used 12, 14 or 16. So we have so you see eddy converter resolution and range. So now finally the signal the, the accuracy is affected by the range. So range is so finally when you have a number how do you convert that number suppose you have a number 0, 0, 1 and it is a and it is a 3 bit eddy converter. So the number is actually 0, 0, 1 divided by 2 to the power 3. So 1 0, 0, 1 by by 2 to the power 3 which is so it is 1 by 8 into the reference voltage in this case suppose it is 1 volt so it is 0.125 volt. So, so that is how so, so obviously you can understand that as the number of bits will go up the resolution will increase and the minimum on the other hand if you have a, suppose you have a 10 volts range and you have a 1 volt signal. Now the point is that you could actually amplify this 1 volt signal. So if you use a let us say a, let us we can write here also that suppose you have a converter which is a dynamic range of 10 volts and you are giving it a signal whose peak to peak value is 1 volt right. So then peak to peak value is 1 volt means the lowest number and it is a 3 bit converter. So then the lowest value is 1.25. So this 0 to 1 very, uh, minus 1 to or let us say let us say 0 to let us talk about unipolar signals so not negative. So, so suppose 0 to 1 if you have a signal then always you will get the value 0. It will the, 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 the variation will not be caught at all. On the other hand if you had amplified it this 1 volt to 10 volt and then taken care of this amplification factor in your software then this signal this 1 volt signal variation would have been captured up to 3 bit resolution. So this shows that always it is you must have amplification enough amplification that is why people sometimes put programmable gain amplifiers. Amplifiers whose gains can be changed again under software control but although they are expensive. So you need to always amplify the signal so that the eddy converter dynamic range that is the range between the reference voltage up to the reference voltage is actually effectively utilized by the input then you get the best resolution for a given number of bits. This is important to remember during data acquisition. So now we are going to take a look at some uh, eddy converters but, but then before that we have a we take a look at a DA converter because an eddy converter circuit it is the most one of the most common things like the successive convert uh, approximation converter uses a DA converter. So we, we just take a quick look at what is a digital to analog converter that is if we put a set of digital bits how can we get an analog voltage which will be proportional to that number. So this is called an R 2 R ladder network for obvious reasons you can see that 2 R 2 R so there are some R R and there are some 2 R resistances there are in double ratio so that is why this is called an R 2 R ladder network ladder because of this form structure. So you see that you can it is rather easy to show using simple network theory that you see these are the switches which are actually controlled by these bits. So now suppose let us let's, let's take the simplest case that if I switch only this MSB so it will get connected here and all the others are connected to this ground okay, this connected to ground. So then what is the voltage that will appear here that is very simple because you have 2R and 2R in parallel now this is connected to ground so therefore it, this resistance is R now this that R and this R is in series so it is 2R again 2R and 2R in parallel again R again R and R in series again 2R and so on. So finally what you get finally what you get is a finally you get this network. So you have a 2R, you have an 2R and then you have a voltage source. So this is your V, this is your V ref and then you have an R and then you have an amplifier and here you have a 2R. So R, 2R, 2R, 2R. So if you do a Thevenin circuit for this this what will be what will be this voltage this voltage is so the so the so the open circuit voltage is going to be v by 2 so it's going to be v by 2 here and what's going to be the thevenin impedance is going to be 2r parallel 2r which is r so this circuit can be further reduced into a network of this form 
So, it can be further reduced as V by 2 in series with a resistance R which is a Thevenin network, then another R which is this one and then the amplifier which is 2R. So, this R and this R will make 2R and this 2R and 2R will give you a gain of 1. So, you get V by 2, right. And so, if you have a total range of the eddy converters, then the MSB should have a total range of n bit converter, then the MSB should have a weightage of V by 2. And you can see that if you only switch on this MSB, you get a VREF by 2 signal here. In this way, you can show that if you if you kept all the others grounded and you put on the next bit on, you would have got V by 4, similarly V by 8 and so on. So now if you depending on your digital numbers, if you if you if you switch on some of them and 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 and, and do not switch on some of them, then you get a corresponding because this this is a linear circuit, so you are going to get superposition principle. So the final signal is going to be VREF properly weighted by the by the with the with the binary number weighting. So you will get a analog voltage which is going to be proportional to the digital number. That is why it is called a digital to analog converter. So in our uh, So, for example, in this eddy converter, this which, which is called successive approximation converter, principle is very simple. You put a signal, the signal first compares whether, suppose this is initially this is 0, initially this is 0, right. So, so this just compares whether this should be, this is higher or this is higher. So, if this is higher, it puts it 1. Now, when it puts it 1, it sets the, this is some logic. So, this, so this will put the maximum bit high that will no so maximum bit means v by 2 so it, so that will come through the da converter and will apply a v by 2 here now the question is whether this analog signal is greater than v by 2 or 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 less than v by 2 if it is greater than v by 2 then it's still one then the next bit will be put so in this way first the msb is put then the next bit put till this signal crosses this signal and then at that level it is stopped so, so that so that is how you 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 just compare it with a with a number of digital uh, uh, number of digital numbers till it exceeds and at that point you stop. So, you get so when you stop you get a set of digital bits which is closest to this analog signal right. So, this is how you convert uh, this, this is how a typical successive approximation converter is and just one way there are many various other converters for example a very fast converter is called flash adc we are not going to discuss that because we don't have enough time but uh, this is this is a converter where you know there you, you do it bit by bit so you need at least uh, worst case you can need n times you can go through this cycle of setting and resetting bits so you need more time on the other hand in this converter the whole conversion is just in one clock cycle so it's much faster but then it requires a huge resistance network and they have to be very very precise otherwise you are going to get errors. So, this is a converter which is therefore, this converter uh, has some problems and although it is very fast. So, we are we are not going to look at that too, too much. If you compare there are various kinds of converters and we are for example, there are there are other converters too we are talking about flash we should saw successive approximation. There are some converters which are called uh, voltage to frequency or uh, integrating converters which are uh, very slow, but but very accurate. So, you can have typical idea about the number of bits flash is 4 to 8 bits typically less number of bits, but very fast uh, conversion. So, you can go up to you know 500 megahertz kind of uh, conversions. Then successive approximation is very widely used 8 to 16 bits possible generally and medium sampling rates for most processes successive approximation is good enough and then you have integrating converters which are quite slow, but very accurate because they do an input averaging over long time and therefore, they take have good response to noise. Uh -uh. So, so having seen that, so now we have seen eddy conversion, now we come to a the system level discussion that typically there are two kinds of data acquisition system that you find, one are called external bus or remote. So, there what happens is that the computer is in a separate place generally and uh, oops, 
I don't know what's happening. Yep. So, uh, so you see here, th these are all these signals, analog signals are getting terminated. Let us assume that it is signal conditioned. We are not, it, if it is not that, then it will be conditioned. Then the eddy conversion, we have seen what is eddy conversion. Then now what happens is that the, is that this thing, this physical, these systems, boxes are separate, are situated at a separate place. They have, they have their own separate power supplies. They are situated possibly much closer to the field. And then here, the, so, so after eddy conversion, so, and they have their own processors. So the value is firstly coming through that M embedded communication controller processor and then using some very standard communication protocol either you know RS 232, 422, 485 or IEEE 488 there are number of protocols by which through computer communication it is coming through what is known as the host computer where this data is going to be used. So this is a small box which is going to be close to the process and then one wire is going to come generally serial communication coming to the computer. So this is an external bus remote data acquisition system. The advantages are that they can they can connect to any host computer. So it's so close to the field, right? Disadvantage is that generally data acquisition rates are limited because of this serial communication. So you can you, you get slightly slower rates of communication, but the, if but if that's good enough for you, it's okay. Second second kinds of things are internal PC bus data acquisition systems where the data acquisition system sits right inside the PC box, right? So and then they, they will communicate with the PC through the through the PCI bus which is much higher speed and which is parallel interfaces, right? So the data acquisition rates can go much faster but, but, this, but this means that the PC has to go close to the field otherwise you are going to have long cablings to the PC, right? So similarly, these are generally designed for specific uh, machines like the like the like Windows PCs. So this is a this is a typical picture of a PC data acquisition board. So what happens is that the board itself has a CPU which transfers the data because it sits on the PC bus. So it will transfer the data to the PC memory, and then the CP, PC CPU can actually take it from the memory and then do a do a display, right? So they are, they, are, they are generally designed for the, this, you know, kind of Windows kind of PCs and they are very common and they are rather cheap and ca especially can be used in a very much in a, in a laboratory scenario and widely used. So these are the basic, these are the basic two types of data acquisition systems. If you take a, if you take a typical specification of a data acquisition system, they, they will, they will mention things like, you know, power consumption, see 5 volt supply has a lot of current requirement because of the digital circuits then a 12 volt supply for analog. The number of channels is, is very important. Typically you have about eight analog channels, either single-ended, you can have eight single-ended, uh, eight differential or six, uh, 16 single-ended channels. Typically number of digital channels are much more, 64, uh, like that because they take only one signal each. Resolution says what, how many bit converter is being used. So it's a 12 bit converter. Accuracy, the AD converter type, then uh, you know this this full scale. Th this is the this is the this is the dynamic range. So it is saying that the that the dynamic range is zero to ten volt DC. Then the eddy converter codes can be available in in various formats, whether it's uh, two complement, uh, true binary, offset binary, various kinds of digital codes are there. The sing this these two specification gain and zero drift specifications are for the signal conditioning block, which is there in the this thing. So the if they, they they will have an amplifier, and that amplifier gain variation and zero drift can be specified and finally the the acquisition time which says that the acquisition time is of the order of 4 microseconds you know so these are these are typical uh, specifications of a data acquisition system which you need to look at when you select one so uh, oops Similarly, finally is a data acquisition software I do not want to talk much about it only thing is that uh, sometimes uh, you can either go for you can uh, these data acquisition software will only come up with some certain drivers and then you can write your own C or basic programs to use the data acquisition systems but that requires a lot of programming although it can give you a lot of 
I mean flexibility in the sense that you can do anything you want with the data, the, the raw data is made available. But this requires a lot of programming and often in, in an industrial situation it is not preferred. So you people use data acquisition software packages. So in programmable software, you uh, the advantage is flexibility and the disadvantage is complexi complexity and a very steep learning curve. While uh, if you have data acquisition software, then it does not require programming. Generally, it requires you know graphical programming in the sense that in using very common sense and domain related uh, quantities, you can actually figure uh, configure the system and get data and then display it. So enables developers to, to design custom instruments best suited to their application. There are various examples. For example, a common one in with which I am familiar is LabVIEW, but there are few others also. So we have, so what we have done during this course, this lesson, uh, we have seen the architecture of data acquisition systems. We have seen the sampling concepts. We have seen the some details of analog to digital conversion, and finally we have taken a look at some data acquisition hardware and software features. So points to ponder is mention three ways in which signal conditioning affects conversion accuracy. So I have already talked about dynamic range, you can think of some others. State where simultaneous sampling and hold is necessary and where it is not. So as I said, it is related to the, to the frequency content of the signals and the speed of conversion of your eddy converter and the number of channels of course. What happens if an anti-aliasing filter is not used before an ADC? So you have to go through if the ADC is successive approximation or if the ADC is flash, so choose the ADC and then go through it and see is that suppose in the middle, suppose the, the signal just goes to zero, then what will happen? Sometimes it may give you wrong results, sometimes it may not. Name three typical functions of a data acquisition software. So one of them could be display. You can figure out the other two by looking at some of the some of these software which are advertised on the internet. So that is all for today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to lesson 11 of the course on industrial automation and control. So far we have uh, learnt about sensors, but before learning about actuators, I, I, I thought that it will be, it'll be more useful to learn about automatic controls, mainly because of the fact that uh, Several actuators are actually closed loop control systems themselves. 